It's baffled scholars for two millennia. It is a puzzle made of multi-dimensional elements, an enigma with roots that reach back to the dawning of time, perhaps before. Daniel explained part of it. Ezekiel and Isaiah had glimpses into it. John saw it all for the time of the end. That time is now. Join Derek and Sharon Gilbert on a journey that spans the course of history, from Eden to Mount Hermon, from Hermon to Babel, from Babel to Rome, from Rome to the cross, and from there to us. Biblical prophecy is coming true before your eyes, and to understand it, you must discern the times both then and now. It's time to unravel the threads of this all-encompassing prophetic paradox. It's time to unravel Revelation. Welcome to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I am Sharon Gilbert, and we are still recording. We've been uh, doing this still Groundhog Day. So once again, <laughs> it's Groundhog Day, and uh, we're in our family room, and we welcome you. We're so glad you're here. Yes, and we appreciate you taking time out of your schedule to pay attention, to watch this program, give us some of your, your precious time. And, and uh, it, it is motivating every week when we, we sit down to do this, thinking that th- there are people out there who are giving of their time not to mention those who've been gracious enough to to support what we do here. Uh, it, it really, I, I know you feel the same way, that we really want to do the best that we can each week because we know that uh, you have other options, <laughs> other places you could be right now. And, and we thank you for giving us uh, your time. And uh, we're happy to invite you in, virtually speaking, into our home. Anytime. Because we record this in advance so that we can upload it to the, uh, uh, well, you know, the PTL network is right. so good to carry our programming. Uh, it takes a little bit of time to do all that. Because of that, we, we are recording this on Groundhog's Day, but mm-hmm. as you're watching this, Derek and I are getting ready to go overseas. Yes, we are headed to Israel this week as you're watching this, assuming you're watching this relatively close to the time it's released. We will be there through um, early April, and uh, which means, of course, if uh, over the next couple of weeks, assuming you're watching this in the month of March 2023, you go to our store at our website, uh, we won't be able to fill any orders until we get back. So because we appreciate it's your patience. Just us. Yeah, it, it truly is. This this operation is us in our house. Um, so literally, mom and pop. But w- but when we come back, we will have some video. God willing that I, I, you, you will find, I think, very, very exciting. Aaron Lipkin, who uh, is the CEO of Lipkin Tours, the company that we partner with for our tours of Israel, is, like us, a fan of archaeology, and he loves to take his camera drone out. So he's going with us to some sites that um, will really shed some light on why Jesus chose to base his ministry and do certain specific things, very key points in his mm-hmm. ministry, why he chose those locations. Well, I think the, the more that you and I learn about the locations of the various points in the New Testament and the Old, mm-hmm. we realize that Old Testament, New Testament, the Lord over and over and over again is doing what Mike Heiser has told us. Mm-hmm. He's reversing things. Yes. His wonderful yes. book, Reversing Hermon, was so important to me because it helped me to see that in the Old Testament, Yahweh's ministry was to take back his land, Mm -hmm. and Jesus' ministry was to take back his land. Right, which is why he spent so much time casting out demons Uh in the New Testament, because demons are the spirits, or at least this is where the evidence points, the spirits of the giants destroyed in the flood of Noah, the giants mentioned in Genesis chapter 6. Now, it's not explicit in our English New Testaments, or English Old Testaments, rather. Um, that's in part because of choices that translators have made over the years in yeah. translating Rephaim as the dead, the shades, the departed. Um, it's also part of, uh, uh, due to a lack of understanding of the culture and the religion mm-hmm. of the pagans around ancient Israel. But... Um, some of that is, I think, really supported by the oh, uh, the yeah. Septuagint translation, as we talked to our friend Doug Woodward about, and mm-hmm. we've got those programs in our archives. Um, things that were de-emphasized in, in um, the Masoretic text, which is what our Old Testament is based on, are more clear in the Septuagint. It's clear in the Septuagint translation. Very clear. That the sons of God in Genesis 6 mm-hmm. were the angels of God. Yes. That when in God fact, divided the nations after the Tower of Babel, he numbered them according to the number of the angels of God. Yes. And sometimes when the original 
says Rephaim, mm -hmm. it's translated as giants. Yes. Gigantes. I, yes, and the Septuagint is very clear in uh, connecting the giants and the titans, the old gods of the Greeks who were punished by being sent into the netherworld, just like the sinning angels mentioned by Peter in 2 Peter 2 and Jude. Um, they're in Tartarus, they're in chains, in the abyss, which opens up again in Revelation 9. It's all interconnected. What we've been taught as Greek and Roman mythology, mm -hmm. it's actually just a fake news version of the spiritual history, supernatural history of the Bible. Yes, and speaking of those entities. Yes. Yes, he is coming to judge those entities. The role that they play in the end times. Uh, one of the key players in the ancient world takes center stage in Revelation chapter 17. Beginning at verse 1, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed sexual immorality, and with the wine of whose sexual immorality the dwellers on earth have become drunk. A couple of... Uh, of points in there. Yeah, and, and a couple of meanings, really, to the term sexual immorality. First of all, the great prostitute, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a... A stretch. I think you, you're right on in the presentations that you've given over the past few years that the great prostitute would be Estarte Ishtar Inanna, the this ancient Sumerian entity deity. who thinks that she is the equivalent of Baal. She's the equivalent of Zeus. She's the equi you, you can name any... Or the equal, not the equivalent, but uh, the, the equal in terms of stature, or should be. I think she sees herself in his place. Right, that's it what... It sees itself. That's what I mean, yes. Because it's not a male, it's... An, no? Originally, yes. this entity was not created male or female, which is one reason it's able to appear as both. Mm -hmm. And her temple servants throughout the ages have been what they call hieroduels, sacred prostitutes, mm -hmm. uh, even to the point where in um, 7th century BC, King Josiah mm -hmm. had to kick out the male prostitutes, the houses of the male prostitutes that were in the temple of God. Can you imagine that? Prostitution taking place inside the temple of Solomon on the Temple Mount. That, 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 that's unimaginable, but it's, it's there in, in Second Kings. Well, it's unimaginable that uh, Solomon would build a temple to Molech yeah. just opposite on the Mount of Olives. Right. Um, the other thing about sexual immorality, though, is that... Uh, and yet he did. <laughs> and yet he did. Um, Inanna uh, Astarte was very much a, a proponent, encouraged its followers to mm -hmm. do those sorts of things. But sexual immorality is a, an image used by the Hebrew prophets to refer to um, um, religious uh, idolatry, to uh, basically falling away from God. Here's an interesting reality. In the pagan world, and I think that we see uh, shadows of that same practice even today, was an idea of sacred marriage. Mm -hmm. This sacred marriage was between the goddess and the ruler, either the ruler of the city or the ruler of a nation state. Mm -hmm. That literally took place between a goddess and the human, or between the human and a representation, a representative right. of the goddess, a woman. Mm -hmm. A priestess yeah. representing... Yes. Yeah, yeah. And if he performed well, then he was considered rightful king, because mm -hmm. he's very, you know, he's all that in a bag of chips. Mm -hmm. If he didn't... <laughs> Yeah. If there yeah. was an actual woman in there and he didn't, well, yeah, well, there was problems. And that's one of the uh, one of the hymns, and and you found this that uh, the uh, one of the hymns about Inanna showed that uh, one of her powers was to uh, basically bless or curse kings on the battlefield. Yes. By making them more manly or less manly. Uh, well, yeah, that gets back to our discussion last week regarding the readiness of the militaries of the world. Right, right. And is this conflict being manipulated by the principalities and powers behind the scenes? Well, of course it is. Yeah. I mean, that's yeah, kind of a rhetorical question. Yeah. It's, well, th th there's a lot that goes on in this world that doesn't make sense from a logical standpoint, but as you found in your research for the Red Wing saga, the path that led to World War I was just one nonsensical reaction after another that led the whole world into yes. you know, tens of millions of people being killed. And it was, it's, it, it, 
There are some historians that want to lay the blame at the blood connections amongst the various thrones Mm -hmm. in Europe. And yes, I think that that has something to do with it. But I would say that the connections are just as tight, if not tighter now, because of uh, the the New World Order and and, uh, Mm geoeconomics, that you get into the idea that we can't go up against Germany because Germany buys from us, and, and, and we can't go up against China because China essentially holds a whole bunch of bonds and a whole bunch of our currency. And, and if they default on us, our, our yeah. dollar suddenly becomes worth They hold worth a lot of nothing. treasury bills. And, and if what happens if the Saudis start taking mm-hmm. uh, payment for their oil in, yeah. in yuan this instead of in dollars? This is part of yeah. this kingdom that she's sitting on, that mm-hmm. Inanna is the head of, and that Nabu has helped her set up. And you know what's really interesting about that, um, without getting too graphic here, but at the World Economic Forum meeting back in January where they came together to decide how the rest of us should live Mm -hmm. because they want to push that great reset. Um, Davos, Switzerland was also flooded with a, uh, a, 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 cadre of oh, yes. ladies yeah. of the evening. Ladies of the evening. Or, were, and, and perhaps men of the evening as well. To Well, they, they bought out an entire hotel. It was yes. essentially, you know, mm-hmm. the hotel the, the brothel. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was part and parcel of it. I'd but say of course, more of that went on than any actual decision making. True. And uh, sadly, that, that also goes on here in the United States. It's, it's tragic, but a lot of sex trafficking takes place around major sporting events like the Super Bowl, the World Series, NBA Mm -hmm. Finals, things like that. Um, It it is just a sad fact of the human condition. Inanna and this idea that carnality is somehow uh, sacrosanct, which is why it's being pushed on our children and who anybody tries to stand up against the grooming of our children um, is so vilified Mm -hmm. by the corporate media and by uh, Hollywood because Molech and Inanna, they, they want their sacrifices. I, I would also argue that the entities that are currently in charge of this world, with Inanna at the head, mm-hmm. and I would say it's seven entities who've gotten together and said, we will give you our power so that you have power. They are the seven hills or mountains. But I think that they realize their time is short. Mm-hmm. They can read the signs right. far better than we can. And somehow they've, they've got it in their minds that there's some loophole that they think they're going to exploit mm. to, to escape the prophecies in the book of Revelation. And I think the entity that uh, calls itself Inanna, Ishtar, whatever you want to call her, that she is so filled with hubris and pride mm-hmm that she really does not think that she can be taken down. Right. I agree. Well, she's got another think coming, and uh, it's going to come from the uh, entities that she thinks are on her side. Mm. Verse 3, And he carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness, or into a desert, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was full of blasphemous names, and it had seven heads and ten horns. Okay, so it's the angel carrying him away. The he pronoun is going back to this angel right, that right. is talking to him. So this angel carries him away in the spirit. You know, this is something that um, we're not called to ask for. Just this is a side note, sidebar mm-hmm. right here, that presently there are spirits masquerading as friendly, as mm-hmm. divine, as good angels, or aliens in some cases. And and these good angels, there are a lot of instance, instances of these good angels coming in, carrying the person away, and showing them all sorts of things about the future. Mm-hmm. And sadly, these individuals that do not have the Holy Spirit within them to teach them discernment think that they're hearing from one of God's messengers. Mm-hmm. They are not. No. These are liars. You, a lot of that is, well, that is a, a big part of the modern UFO phenomenon, mm-hmm. sadly. These people who think that they're hearing from our space brothers through telepathic communication, uh, they're really hearing from angels and demons. They are. Whereas in this case, Yahweh himself, right. the one sitting on the throne, Jesus Christ, who's actually on the thr- throne, mm-hmm. it, they're, they're the same. He has sent this angel to carry John away in the spirit. Right. Now, into a wilderness or into a desert, 
Th- ah. This is this is one of the clues that uh, our friend Joel Richardson uses to support his claim that uh, Mecca is the great uh, is is Babylon the Great, Mystery well, Babylon. Well, I don't think so. I think that this idea of a wilderness, it's we see it in the Old Testament as well. Mm-hmm. A wilderness is a place of uh, fallen spirits of right, demon, right. demons. Mm-hmm. I am wavering on my, because I agreed with Joel in my book, Bad Moon Rising, I argued that I thought, yes, Mecca was the the uh, location of Mystery Babylon. Mm-hmm. The, uh, all of the kings of the world are, are fornicating with, with her. And you can make a case that because oil is the coin of the realm, mm-hmm. that the Saudis uh, and OPEC in general, especially the Gulf states, could fulfill that role. But I don't, see how this would fulfill the role of being that one world end times religion. No. Uh, that's that's difficult to figure out how this could fit into that. Um, anyway, the uh, the Scarlet Beast with seven heads and ten horns, uh, John gets an explanation of that here in just a little bit. I, I will mention this, and then we'll take a break, that the blasphemous names um, on the, the beast, there are scholars who've connected this to the little horn mm-hmm. speaking blasphemous things of Daniel chapter 7 mm-hmm. and connected that and this to Typhon, the chaos monster of Greek religion, whom Zeus had to subdue in order to, you know, basically preserve the natural order of things. Okay, we haven't read that part yet that you're referring to, the blasphemous names. Uh, we, we've read about a, on her forehead was written a name of mystery. Uh, well, verse three. I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet oh, beast sorry, that was full sorry. of blasphemous names, so, well, with see, seven heads and ten horns. You don't have it on the screen in front of you. <laughs> I need a prompter. No, you're right. I knew I'd heard it, but I was trying to find it if it was a future verse or not. In the future, after the break. <laughs> <laughs> yes, unraveling revelation continues after this. Prepare for spiritual war by arming yourself with information. Take advantage of these specials through March that dig deep into the Bible to help you make sense of the chaos around us. First, our Veneration Bundle, our two co-authored books, plus the Travelogue DVDs from our Israel tours. An $85 value, just $45 plus shipping and handling. The Second Coming of Saturn Bundle, featuring my book and the 13-part Companion DVD, a $50 value for just $35 plus shipping and handling. The This Is War special offer featuring the second coming of Saturn, four DVDs, and seven hours of audio interviews with Bible scholar Dr. Michael Heiser, a $145 value for just $75 plus shipping and handling. And the Gilbert Fiction Collection, all eight novels in Sharon's Red Wing Saga series plus my two novels, a $200 value for just $140 plus shipping and handling. These offers are available through March only at our online store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And again, we thank you for your prayers and support. Welcome back to Unraveling Revelation. I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and this week I remembered to put the little cups of water. Ah. Actually, still Groundhog Day, so, you know. Yes, we're just reliving it over and over again. again. Uh, But yes, we want to tell you about Build Barn Better. Yes, we're borrowing a phrase from the World Economic Forum and improving it. They want to build back better. It's really build back babble. But we want to build barn better. We've got a 1,200 square foot, a 30 by 40 shop building on our property which we've really used for very little storage. other than just storage for eight years. And we are, well, as you can see, we're, we're recording this in our family room. We've got two other bedrooms that are used as studios and another bedroom that is used as an office uh, for shipping books and DVDs. We'd like to move that out there and uh, we can do it. We're, we're not looking at anything fancy. We're not planning on building any interior walls or spending a lot of money on the set. We just want to insulate it run power all the way around the building. It's got partial power now. We need to run uh-huh. a separate 30 amp circuit for HVAC so we can heat it and cool it and uh, put in a couple of windows in yep. to replace the storm windows that it's got. And that's pretty much it. Pretty much it. Simple set. I'm thinking sort of like hee-haw. <laughs> I get to wear my overalls. <laughs> Barrels and... I love that. Actually, yeah, I do think something of straw. very... Very Ozarky would be great. Right. I think I agree. I yeah. think so too. Um, you know, our studio camera is an iPad. Yeah. And uh, when we use multiple cameras, we add our iPhones. So that's what we're looking at here. And we've got estimates on the work. Uh, we, we figure it'll take $15,000 or thereabouts. If you can help us, uh, if you are so led to uh, help us build Barn better, you'll find a link at our website, gilberthouse.org. It's in the right-hand column, a big red button, or gilberthouse.org slash donate. 
And, uh, but most of all, we appreciate your prayers as we go through this. We've got to find a place to move all of the stuff that's out there and mm. uh, find a place to park the yard tractor. Yeah, so, we'll figure yeah. it out one day at a time. Yes. So thank you very much. We appreciate your, your prayers and your support. We really do. And we also appreciate the fact that you're going to gilberthouse.org slash store and you're actually buying stuff from us. Mm-hmm. Sadly, however, we're very quickly, after we you watch this, we're probably packing our bags and getting ready to go to Israel. So we won't be here from about, the, I'd say, the 13th of March through... Mm-hmm. Uh, maybe April 5th, the store is likely to be closed because we're going early and we may even stay a day or two late. But yep. uh, we have some filming to do. Yes, so we will come back with uh, video and uh, immediately get to work on a couple of projects. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll tell you about those as uh, those come together. But uh, just bear in mind for the next several weeks, Anything at the store, uh, well, we just we will not be here. And since we are the, the shipping office, that's uh, we're, we're going to be out of the country. Yep, so. it's just us. So, well, uh, yes. we move back to uh, Revelation 17 and uh, verse 4 now. The woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet. Purple, the color of royalty. Yes, exactly, which is what she thinks she is. Mm-hmm. And adorned with gold and jewels and pearls, holding in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the impurities of her sexual immorality. Again, mm-hmm. the uh, faithlessness of uh, the rebellion against God. Mm-hmm. And I have seen it said that this is actually the uh, church in Rome. Yeah. No, I don't think so. I think this is not a church in any way, shape, or form. This is an actual entity in charge of the anti-church elements of the world. It's the there church is, of woke. It's what. That's one aspect of it. She def- definitely wants to turn women into men and men into women. But I de- what we have to remember, it's so tempting to take one group and say, they're the ones. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they, they do this or they do that, and we know that they're evil. Every denomination has issues. Every denomination, because we're all human. Right. And every human is likely to make a mistake. And the higher up you get in an organization, sometimes you sort of lose touch with the purpose behind that organization, as in Christ first and always. Mm-hmm. So uh, that, that's easy to do. You and I, we're, I, I want to stay small. Yeah. Because I just don't want to ever be tempted to forget Christ is our right. reason for Where doing this. Where we wind up doing the program because we've got payroll to meet or something. Right. Yeah. No, that yeah. isn't it. No. When we get to that point, we need to, we need to stop. We need to yeah. rethink. Exactly. So, no, no, I don't think this is Rome. This is something else. I, I agree. And I think the, the teaching that Rome is represented here by Mystery Babylon became popular during the Protestant Reformation. It did. Because it made for a... Uh, a convenient target. In fact, Mm -hmm. Raymond Ibrahim, who's become a friend of ours, he's a historian who writes about the history of Islam and specifically about the conflict between Islam and the West over the past 14 centuries, has pointed out that from a strategic perspective, the timing of the Protestant Reformation couldn't have been worse because it was about the time that Luther turned things upside down and uh, split Christians in the in, in Western Europe, Christendom, mm-hmm. the Ottoman Empire was making inroads and trying to move into uh, Europe. It the, weakened Christendom. Two, the, yeah, and there were two long sieges of um, Vienna, one in the 15th century, one, 16th century, one in the 17th century, mm-hmm. and uh, almost captured Vienna, at which point Rome would have been vulnerable, Western Europe would have been vulnerable, uh, but the king of Poland, Jan Sobieski, mm. with the charge of the winged hussars um, in, in, was it 1680, I think? Uh, something like that. Anyway, it was, it was late enough that uh, there were already English colonists here in North America for, you know, five, 50 or 60 years by the time of this battle outside Vienna. Right. Um, anyway, um, had Christendom not been so divided, uh, they might have been, it found it easier to come together and fight back the mm-hmm. incursion of the Ottomans. They nearly made it all the way through France. Well, yeah. They were stopped in France. In 732 AD. Yeah, yeah Charles Martel at the praise, Battle of Tours. Praise the Lord. Right. And then later, Jan Sobieski's charge helped to t- stop them in, in uh, Austria. Uh, but, you know, the, the Viennese got some great coffee out of they, it. They did. <laughs> That's how the Viennese discovered coffee. <laughs> and croissants. And the, the Ottomans okay. fled and left behind their beans. Yeah, but uh, um, no, this is not Rome. This is, 
I think this is a world entity. Mm-hmm. This is she's the ruler of the new world order, whatever you want to call it. And it's this whole wokeism is one way to put it, but it's so much more than that. There are there are geopolitical ideas on all sides that are falling into her um, ideas. Mm-hmm. They they are going with her uh, whispers. Mm-hmm. Because it gives that person power. Yeah. It's all about power. Mm-hmm. And she sees herself, I think, as the uh, one who will replace God mm-hmm. on his throne when they somehow manage to topple him. You know, the funny thing about the pearls that she's wearing, pearls symbolize virginity. <laughs> well, rather ironic. It is. Yeah. It's yeah. very ironic. Mm-hmm. The And of course, I'm wearing... Sort of fakies. Um, no, I'm not saying I'm that. But you know, Queen Elizabeth the First, she was covered in pearls in her portraits mm-hmm. to remind her people she was the Virgin Queen. Right. Oh, hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Well, one final verse here, and then we'll have to get onto the uh, the balance of this next week. And as I predicted last week, it's going to take several weeks to get through Mystery Babylon. We'll just um, take our time. Verse five on her forehead was written the name of a mystery: mm. Babylon the Great, mother of prostitutes and the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. So not Mystery Babylon, although Mystery Babylon is sort of a term that's been applied to uh, this end times church. The mystery is the identity of Babylon the Great. Yes, it is. And and there's still argument about how to identify her. We want to tease next time, though. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. Mm -hmm. But the angel said to me, why do you marvel? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast with seven heads and ten horns that carries her. Right. This is why I say those seven hills are not geographical points. They are spirits, and I think that they relate to Leviathan. I agree with you 100%, and I think the ten horns also represent supernatural entities. And we'll find that out later. Maybe whispering in, to humans? Yes. The uh, elders? Kings who are waiting for their kingdoms? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we will talk about that in the weeks ahead, depending on how quickly or slowly we get through this. But um, while this was revealed to John, yes, it is still debated 2,000 years later, and there are men and women whom we respect with v- differing views on, on who this represents. Is Absolutely. it Rome? Is it, uh, is it Islam? Is it, uh, is it New York? Is it Jerusalem? You can make cases for all of those. Um, the bottom line, the thing to remember about end times prophecy is this. God has not revealed it completely yet because he's still in the middle of a war. And God, Yahweh of armies, is not going to unveil or reveal his plans to the enemy before it's time. They will know what he's going to do when he Mm -hmm. appears on the battlefield. And on that day when he becomes the Holy One in Israel. Yes. Yeah. Thank you for watching. This is Unraveling Revelation. Unraveling Revelation is a viewer-supported outreach of Gilbert House Ministries. We'd love to hear from you. Contact us through our websites or drop us a line at P.O. Box 78, Crane, Missouri, 65633.